Yes, welcome back. This is F a Rap Critic. I'm your boy Malik16, and no, it's not a setup. I'm not exactly sitting sideways this time, but I am keeping it green so we can keep it the theme. Let's make sure we zero in on that hat. That's a Clash One original there. Shout out to the homie Dope Artist, Dope Designer, Extended Fam, always looking out. And since we're talking about Extended Fam, I got to shout out the makers of the hoodie that I'm rocking right now. Let's, let's get that love sweatshirt in there, courtesy of Honest Tees, Black Five Fifths. Y'all should go check them out too. Shout out to Dre, shout out to Lee. Uh, you know we always represent here. And since today is officially the 25th anniversary of the album that we're talking about, I can formally say happy birthday to it. And uh, with no further ado, we're going to go into it right after you take a moment to like and subscribe. This is Category 2. We're talking about the rap performance on this album. And the first dimension in Category 2 is going to be Dimension 1, Personality and Charisma. All right. Now, this is going to be probably the trickiest dimension of this entire category for me to try to break down. Because I think with someone like Guru, it becomes harder to articulate exactly what it is he does with his presence that displays personality um, in, in a way that really keeps you locked in, but it does happen. So the best way for me to describe how Guru's personality shines through on this album is to kind of compare him. Uh, comparatively, I imagine him like the cool uncle the cool uncle that you might see at the same club or the same party that you're at. Y'all both look at each other like, what the hell are you doing here? But he's not going to tell your mom. He might pull you to the side and be like, hey, you know you're not supposed to be here, kid. Yeah, Guru's not animated. He's not using any theatrics to get his points across. So you're left to rely on what he says in his verses to, to glean his personality. Also with personality, there is a sense of wisdom. A lot of that can come from the, the 5% aspects, but there's a wisdom tapping into that uncle energy, but still a, a willingness to get ignorant. Like when you hear his claims towards enemies, haters, and, and other rappers, like, hey, I'll wave this pistol, I'll, I'll take your girl. It, he's not beyond that. That's what I mean, that young uncle. I'm still doing the young things, but I have this wisdom. I'll still drop a jewel on you. It's not like the old guy at the club that's obvious. They're like, oh man, what are you doing here? Like, kind of like, oh, you know, he might have the flyest leather jacket and a fedora. So he's very aware of his place. He's not trying to kick it with the kids, but he's also not on his old man stuff yet. So an extension of that, if I really wanted to take that abstract theory further or that analogy further, there's a Nas quality to what Guru does. And I know... There are a lot of rap conversations about Rakim being the father to Nas' style, or, you know, Rakim had to walk so Nas could run. But I think there are more parallels in how Guru approaches versus to, to Nas than, uh, than Rakim, because Guru does a lot of the things that we've seen Nas do over his career. This idea of denouncing the gun violence, but also warning others to step back before he has to use his gun. So he straddles that contradictory line. There's an observational quality where he's telling street stories and Guru's always managed to keep Gangstar as a street level group. I've talked in previous episodes about the ideas of some rappers being able to be street level or street adjacent where they're not technically gangster rap or gangster rappers but they're telling street level tales and get lumped in the same vein as some of the street rappers. I think I mentioned us who grew up knowing Gangstar as a golden era group that kind of slid in without that youthful upstart placement. And they just kind of lined up right there with the Kooji raps and everyone else who was doing their thing. Uh, if I'm thinking of this album as if I'm listening to it as a new rap listener, someone of this generation being introduced to it, I have to be able to separate that quality of what I know about Guru already, right? So if I'm listening to it as a new rap listener, what is it about what Guru does on this mic that keeps me wanting to hear more? I think one of the things is that he is giving you a variety of things that he's speaking on 
whether it's observationally or from his own experience um, and feelings that you have enough to latch on to. I don't know if this was a entirely preachy guru album, if that would work, or if this was an entirely braggadocio guru album, if it would work. I think it works best because he's telling you about him shopping, him dating, him being played, him learning from regrets. You will hear him talk about regrets. Um, but with that, you see that there's a human quality. As much as his 5% ideologies pour through and you know that he wants to send a message and kick knowledge, he also is not above just kind of surface material things as well. And even though he doesn't use humor on this album, you get the idea that he's not above humor. So unlike uh, Paris or even Rakim, who I just mentioned, or Chuck D, he's not too serious to crack a smile or, you know, you don't get that impression that it's nobody smiling. He just happens not to employ humor as a tool uh, of choice here. Um, and so if any of you are able to find ways to identify the personality aspects on this album better than I did, uh, feel free to leave that in the comments. If you feel like there was no personality at all, you were just listening for the beats. Uh, that's also something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. And that takes us to dimension two, where we talk about the suspension of disbelief or the believability quality. So right in line with everything I was just talking about, about who showing you these different sides. This is clearly not an album where you're being asked to suspend your disbelief, except for the typical rapper claims. But because this is the most cathartic gangstar project, you understand that it's wrapped up in this very real moment of true circumstance dealing with the legal issues that Guru was facing. And when you take into account that you're privy to that information, that Google really did have these charges and they're being addressed in these different pockets, you don't really get him talking about the cases uh, in any actual detail or even acknowledging the, the charges. He alludes to them, he speaks vaguely about them, but he mostly focuses on his feelings. Someone left in the comments that they had re-listened to Moment of Truth and, and saying how lyrically deep it was. And I think there's a depth to it because you're not used to hearing rappers talk about their inner feelings and anguish of going through regret. And that's the extent of what you're gonna hear Guru talk about. He's saying this grown man will make mistakes no longer on JFK to LAX, but he's also not telling you what the mistakes are. He's just saying, man, I'm dealing with the weight of the decisions I've made, but I'll take that weight like I did before. So you're just hearing grown man inner conflict speak, which back then wasn't super popular. There, there's some, some credit that needs to be given to that, hearing hearing him think out loud. That's what you're, you're gonna get. Dare I say you could argue that there's a little bit of dodging accountability just because these legal issues were fact. Uh, even though the charges got dropped, that didn't happen while this album was being recorded. That came after the fact. And nonetheless, he was still involved in these situations. And in every song, you hear him kind of blaming external factors like, oh, it's the judicial system. Oh, it's the people, it's the snakes that I'm around. And you don't really hear him saying, man, I did this and I won't do this again. But you do hear him say, even in the midst of blaming others, I'm just going to avoid those same traps again. But there's a lot of external blame going on. You know, the fact that JFK to LAX is followed by It's a Setup, which is followed by Moment of Truth. It's all driving that whole theme home. Like, man, they out to get me, right? Um, but there, there are softer moments, like when he speaks on the alcoholism. And so he'll talk about his own stuff in the midst of talking about somebody else's stuff. So you take a track like My Advice to You, and he's talking about noticing his friend's downward spiral through bad habits. He's like smoking and drinking, I see the toll it's taking on you. And he's like, for someone like me, that could be bad news. So that's about as close as you get to him addressing the apparent alcoholism that he had been reported to have been suffering, or at least the poor patterns of drinking that uh, he had been going through. 
that Primo pointed out were behind a lot of their inner turmoil and conflict. And he addresses that, again, vaguely with illusion, but you're hearing nonetheless, Guru. Even on the more abstract songs, you're hearing his perspective. You're hearing his thoughts. So when he starts making the more outlandish rap claims that most rappers, that are common on most rap albums, you know, big claims like I'll erase you off the map, uh, I'll end your career, I'll take your spot, uh, no post, you're gone. Or it's tragic like the havoc from a nuclear bomb, like to be expected. Question always comes down to how much do you believe Guru on this mic and his guest? Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats that takes us to dimension three, which is going to be the most important thing that we talk about in this entire category delivery. It's impossible not to spend a nice chunk of time talking about this dimension when you have an artist that's so highly self-aware in this regard that he frequently mentions it, that he is a monotone rapper, the king of monotone at that point. And this is the part that made the personality conversation a little tricky because so much of what rappers typically would do to show you personality is buried by him having this monotone presence that you have to pick it up in different areas. His voice, and I feel confident saying this, that Guru's voice is 85% of his presence on the microphone. Because in reality, it, it, throughout Gangstar history, Guru is not known for being a lyricist lyricist. He's also not known for having this dynamic personality. I think a lot of things that have helped Gangstar is that no one was making beats that sounded like Premiere before Premiere, and no one sounded like Guru before Guru. This lane hadn't even been created. Being the first and then being the only one for a long time allows you to get away with certain things, uh, let alone the fact that when Gangstar first came out, uh, everybody was rapping a little bit more energetically. Most rappers rap a little bit more energetically when they're younger. Then they find a groove and they stick to a calmer format. Most of us start off like that. Uh, so Guru definitely had more projection on the first two Gangstar albums compared to the later two, uh, the later three, right? And then again, it wasn't normalized. So it's a standout quality as opposed to as we entered the 2000s, we started seeing more things okay that weren't acceptable or normalized in the 90s. And so nowadays, it's not uncommon to hear the popularity of a rapper like a Currency, Larry June, or uh, Dom Kennedy, who just kind of have this talk approach and people love it and they live by it and they, and they, they swear by it and they have a loyal fan base. And at the time, Guru was the one who pioneered breaking that door down. The sound just kind of steady. I bring up Rakim again because Rakim is often credited with this calm, patient essence, but people all often leave out Rakim's menace. There was always a menace that was present with that calmness, and it didn't feel like I'm so laid back. It just felt like when you see big cats stalking their prey, like, no, this man is always sharp, on point, and a threat, and that's what happens with his delivery. There's a sharpness to the delivery. Guru is laying the words out in a measured order. You, he's not ripping through tracks. Um, and so there's a measured quality and there's a chill. That chill is different than just calm and patience. Even when he's emphasizing words, it's still within the, uh, the same cadence. Like, right? cause we still care. He adds just enough variation in the ups and downs of his voice for you to know when he wants to emphasize a certain word or emphasize a certain point, but he's still not adding that animated quality or, or just crazy change in inflection where you're like, oh, this is different. It's the same voice, the same measured kind of style, no matter what the pattern is. And that is the selling point. There's, there's a rasp in there and in that rasp you're hearing the signs of someone who's seen a lot who's been weathered um 
and, and has regrets. There's someone who is, again, he's not using humor, but you can tell that he's not above humor. He finds the humor in things. And, and with that, you know, only Guru can pull off certain songs because of his voice. A beat like Robin Hood Theory is almost so basic and so draggy that it would lose a lot of listeners if the wrong rapper was on it and Guru is just the right rapper for it. Cause that, <laughs> now that we're getting somewhere, you know, we gotta get back. Cause the youth is our future, no doubt that's right and exact. It just, it rides in the same space. That was the, the perfect marriage right there. And I should also add, Guru doesn't ad lib. That's another thing. So what you get is what you get when we're talking about his delivery. It's his voice and he doesn't feel the need to double and, and, and stack his vocals and, and to, to put different emphasis on certain pieces of it. It's like, here you go. I want you to hear this conversation. So the other place where the album benefits and helps to counter the, the threat of monotony from having your star player be monotone is the contrast you get with all the guest voices and Guru's voices. Every guest here compliments Guru because no one else sounds like Guru. So you take songs like The Mall or Friendship versus B.I. or It's a Setup or Make Em Pay where those voices, even Betrayal, they just really, really sound like nice breaks. And then you go back to the warmth and steadiness of what you get in from Guru's voice. Great pair ups sonically. But yeah, Guru's delivery in a nutshell, steady, measured, chill. Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. All right, that takes us directly into dimension four, the flow. One of the things that never dawned on me until I revisited this album and started listening to it again, of course, for these episodes, is the idea that every core member of the Gangstar Foundation pretty much uses the same flow structure and patterns. So you take uh, a Malachite Nutcracker kind of flow like, growing in the ghetto, it's hard to survive. Some have a need that many people try, right? <laughs> or even little that, right? Check it out like this. And then like that, or J. Rue the Damager, my mind spray, my nine spray. Big Shook's verse on the militia could have very well been Guru's verse, and we just would not have been the wiser because the patterns are so similar. If heads only knew how I felt about the rap game, they retire and change their names. Picture Guru saying all of those lines. The delivery is what separates all of them, but the flow structures are the same. It's, it's kind of telling of when crews spend a lot of time around each other and come from the same core element. And so Guru shines the most when he revisits flows that he himself made popular in the early 90s on some of the earlier Gangstar projects. So Guru does uh, what, what's a nice hybrid between a style I've mentioned before. I talked about this in our Mob Deep episode on Hell on Earth review, where I was talking about the style that Queens rappers made familiar, this listing style. It's like, I want a net, you know, like kind of this, you can see the commas in the style. And then the stacking flow, which there's two forms of the stacking flow. There's an older school version and a newer school version. So the newer school version, you might hear me also call it clustering, but it's when you're stacking syllables with a lot of internal rhymes. That's more the Eminem Royce the Five Nine school of thought where you're stacking and clustering, right? The older school style is where the words are just kind of carrying over, so they stack in that way. What Guru did is, is a blend of both of those put together. And so that style gets revisited on spaces like the end of the very last verse on You Know My Steeds where he's like, yo, it's pathetic, synthetic, like rayon, that's a crayon one, don't rise for me on. And I mentioned the bounce, the natural bounce pattern that he follows on the track work, where he's like, Jake scoped me out, haters wanna pat me down, clap me down, clap, all you heard was the sound, and yo, I scoped it out, I took your weak dream and choked it out. Borrowing a little bit more from that, 
queen style, but there's a bounce. And so he's able to keep that up with a little bit more energy and it just sounds more invigorating. Uh, the other flow that he revisits from earlier Gangstar albums is what he does on the beginning of the Rep Grows Bigger. Uh, again, a more playful bounce. So you got your first piece of dirty. So if Guru would have done a little bit more of that throughout the album, you would have felt like you got a greater variation. But the default flow pattern that you're going to hear, which turns out being the dominant, is going to be that go to Gangstar Foundation flow, which is straightforward. And unfortunately, it also means that on the slower tracks, Google goes into a territory of just flat out talking. Uh, there's tracks on here, the slower ones seem to be him really not riding any particular beat and just making his words fit. He's never completely off beat, but a lot of times he rushes his lines. Where this kind of slow down approach may have worked or fared a little bit better on previous Gangstar albums, on songs like Love Sick, but what you need to take into account is that Guru is also making more of an effort to marry that bass line and drum hit where it kind of stayed in line. Here, there's just, it's, it's free flowing. And so on tracks like She Knows What She Wants, he's not following any specific pattern, even when he tries to give it some order. So when he does the line, like one, she told me she would have my son, two, something, 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 something. three, da, 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 da. Four, she was my Sharia more. It just sounds flat. And so from a rapper's mind, a writer's mind, any any trained rapper ear would hone in on the fact that not only is Google uh, a writer's rapper, like he, he's a rapper who you could tell pin and pad, like old school style, but also someone that most likely reads the rap as they're recording in the booth and without the prep time or memorization, like, I'm going in, I just wrote this, I'm recording it now, and he raps like he's reading it. There's just this natural telepathy that <laughs> seasoned rap writers have where you can also tell what was, you can get the gist of what was going on through the rapper's mind as they were writing. Guru has a penchant for using these lazy writing catches to kind of fill out his verses. And so it's not uncommon for him to in his verses with preposition slang or, or just filler words that make it rhyme. Like he loves ending sentences with the word kid because kid is, is a, a word that can rhyme with a lot of things based on the vowel sound. He also in lines with the word yo, like one that jumps out to me from the title track, Moment of Truth is something like, I get ready to react and yo, he adds that, he, he'll do that a lot. And something that a fair amount of rappers from an older generation seem to do where they don't feel like continuing the rap flow or they run out of uh, lines that, that follow that flow and they want to switch. It's like an abrupt segue instead of naturally gliding your verse in a direction. He'll just rhyme the nearest adjacent word to the finish the sequence, right? And so I think of like what he did on what I'm here for hearts and minds shine bright light with insight instead of rhyming that line with whatever four or two lines preceded it to come up with a longer rhyme scheme he just grabs something with the word bright because it's the nearest word and he just wants to be done with that sequence and start a new one this might be something you do when you have kind of portions like maybe four bars here and eight bars here and you just kind of want to blend these two rhymes together uh, so he does that often and the whole ending with preposition things and he's not he's not opposed to stretching out a word to make it rhyme uh, he would slow a word down in the middle of a flow just to get it in there that all tells me yeah you're reciting it as you're reading it and however it catches however it's got to catch the land and the best way it ain't always to act nasty <laughs> you know just to to make it work so like I, I, I know how that feels. I know how that goes. I'm a writer who likes to memorize whatever I'm doing before I go in that booth. Not every time do situations lend themselves to that luxury. So sometimes you have to do your best to put as much inflection in every word as you can. And you know, sometimes you just want to get the job done. One take Jake, I get it. I mentioned how I felt like MOP's presence 
on VI versus Friendship help Google step it up a notch. And it comes in uh, those pockets of his flow that I feel like maybe we're inspired by MOP's verses because their placement and their timing of where they leave space in certain lines and where they ad lib, since Google doesn't really ad lib, helped their verses stand out. Billy Dance does way more of that on his verse than Lil Fame. And so you take from the first two bars, Billy Dance is coming in with the ad lib, right? We all we got. Then the next one is, can I get a witness? Then Google steps in, is like, preach on, nigga. And then that whole, I'm invaluable to my niggas. It's an old rusty ass 32, better than nothing. And then you see on Guru's verse, where he leaves these little spaces that he didn't do in other verses. So he's like, we come to a fork in the road. And I know I left you with way more than a portion of gold. So keep that. And then the other line where he's like, can't afford for a link to be loose in the chain. Son, son is trying to get more juice in the game. And then in the background, MOP is ad-libbing it. Loose in the, juice in the game. Or <laughs> keep that there bolstering what he already did but just him leaving those spaces and switching his flow up just minimally just adds a different texture than what he'd done on other verses on the album and nothing else really sounds like that one moments like that and that's why i think those tracks like work stand out so much because it sounds like what did he do different it sounds like he committed to memorizing or at least marrying a pattern with an energetic presentation. So all these things are something to consider. The default Gangstar Foundation flow, the kind of talking vibe of the slower songs, the revisiting of the older Gangstar flows that sound like they're resuscitated, and then those like lazy writing and recitation prompts that, you, that you're able to pick up on. So that takes us to Dimension 5, the wordplay and bar intent. More than anything, you're going to hear Guru use imagery. From listening to Guru's verses, you pick up on a few things. One, that um, there's a lot of conviction in what he's saying, and also that this is a man with a wide vocabulary. And coming from two different places, right? Where there's some rappers, you can tell their vocabulary comes from a space of education whether self-education or formal school education. If you know Guru's history, you know that he's on, on an academic level. Now, the other part of that is the 5% teachings. There's going to be an educational aspect to that too because it's so vested in the idea of studying. You study your 120 lessons, you're going to be using words that you naturally would use before you got that knowledge itself, right? So you're not hearing the typical non-5% rapper come on tracks and saying something like, I self-lord and master shall bring disaster to evil factors, demonic chapters shall be captured by kings. Like, that word choice is, is everything. It's telling you all about the kind of wordplay you're going to get on here. And that's the extent. It's not the kind of wordplay that's lending itself to these clever rhetorical devices. Guru usually as much as he uses simile, it's gonna be very, very pedestrian, very elementary level. Like, you dig it and you dug it because like money, you love it. Or like in Vogue, here's something you can feel. That's about it. Uh, you're not getting these crazy comparative language moments that make you go, oh, I can't believe he said that. There's moments of alliteration, which again, speak to Guru's vocabulary, I think on what I'm here for it is a, a short sequence where he's like uh, menial minimalist mind I'll put it up there because I don't want to mess up the line but it's it's not long it's just like three or four M words used in succession of each other so there's there's those moments of him utilizing what he's utilizing but it's the language the words he chooses and the imagery that he conjures up with those words. To that point with the lazy writing cues, I noticed this is also something that Fife was prone to doing in a lot of his verses, just kind of spacing it out with an extra word to make sure it lands on the timing that you want. So you might squeeze a word like friggin', like Fife was and Guru, they were good for using something, something with your friggin' that. Like, 
I don't think that's a word that most rappers or writers would consciously put in their verse if they weren't just trying to fill in the space. Uh, unless, you know, you're trying not to curse, cool, you'd say friggin', but it just also seems like a space filler word. And, and Guru will do things like that. Anyway, another callback thing that Guru does is on at least two of the songs on this album, he ends or begins the verses the same way. So on New York Straight Talk, he repeats the refrain, bright lights, big city and dark alleyways, New York, we get the money all day, every day, right? Um, and then on In Memory Of, as Premier shouting the person out, he pulls the name and it's like, to my man, I remember how you used to be, right? That gives the verses a little bit of uniformity, but it still can't save them from the different spaces they spill out as they're being wrapped. Another facet of wordplay is what's done on the song, The Mall. Primo says the guru is usually the one that comes up with the album titles, where they take turns with the album titles. The guru always comes up with the song titles, sometimes before he even writes the song. And so it wouldn't be a crazy assumption to think that Guru went in there telling the other rappers, hey, this is what we're doing in each of our verses, because each one of those rappers spin their verses mentioning name brands and department stores. And so Guru in his verse is saying stuff like, Victoria be whispering mad secrets in my ear. And you hear Shiggy Shah and G Depp mentioning name brands like Iceberg, Kuji. Uh, I think G Depp took me back with some, some brands I haven't heard in a while. He used to buy Mount North Face and Dolomite boots and, and things like that. But they're weaving it into these separate little anecdotes that they're doing for their verses. Um, and so that's a form of wordplay. You get that, you get the alliteration, you're getting these moments, but not in any super uh, noticeable or overwhelming way. Profundity is what you're getting out of Guru's wordplay more than anything else. It's not how he's saying anything, it's what he's saying. You know, he makes his statements very clear. So in a song like It's a Setup, he's playing the straight man, which allows Hannibal, the guest feature, to go into this space of complexity. But the contrast of their voices wakes the song up too because it's a dark beat and Hannibal, he just sounds so grisly on it. You think he's coming with the, the more raw, but when you really read his lyrics, it's more abstract poetry than anything else. He's probably got the more conscious verse because his whole thing is about rising above these street level traps that get people in jail. And he's speaking for someone knowing that experience, right? So he's saying lines like, Corpus delecti cost me lost and found on enemy ground or, you know, underground railroad on track, no physical or mental chain could shackle that black on black leading the block. Like, it's just, he's not speaking straightforward. It's way more in line with like the kind of stuff that Wu-Tang was doing where you, you get the gist of what's being said, but he's saying it in these unorthodox sentence structures that are poetic language. Guru's verse on that song is way more straightforward. He's saying, look, you toting jeans don't even know the true enemy, a fan of big and of pop, and plus they both were friends to me, past trivial pursuits like East and West Coast feuds. And then he goes back in the braggadocio right before bringing it back to this idea of describing how a lot of parties or, or concerts get messed up because people want to bring violence to it. That's whack for the group, and plus the others who came to see a fat ass show and said there's bullets aflame. Straight to the point. You're not in mystery of what Guru's talking about. So there's songs where he gets to play the straight man and the guest gets to be as free and lyrically complex as they want to be. You take Make Em Pay, which is the reverse of that. I think on that track, Guru is being more abstract. He's weaving in and out of bragging dropping knowledge he doesn't know where he wants to go on that right he's like there's 17 million of us plus two million indians and he's just like going at but then talking about catching wreck on the mic with crumb snatchers versus all focused his whole narrative is when did rapping and being a thug become intertwined and why can't we separate the two because we see the consequences of what that image is promoting and i don't want any parts of that and he's saying I may not be the one to end it, but I'm sparking a revolution against that. And again, another rapper coming from that lived space. Like, look, I really do this in real life, and I'm saying this is whack. 
he gets to be the straight man on that track while Google's all over the place, right? I'm universal on all planes. What's y'all claim? So that's also where the guest features help um, just bring this album together. That contrast works when we're talking about wordplay and bar intent as well. Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats that takes us directly into dimension six. The overall quotability of this album, the punchlines or poetic wisdom. If we're talking guru, we can eliminate the conversation of punchlines straight off the bat. There's nothing on this album that gives you the impression that Guru is even in the, the mindset of even thinking about punchlines. The closest we get to that is on work where he says, you don't really got no ass, she just poked it out, which is probably the closest you get to humor as well, which lets you know that he's not above this kind of thinking or talk, but he's just not gonna be employing that throughout the album. That's not his go-to, it's not on his radar, it's not in his radius. Where you will get punchlines, of course, it's left for your, your talked about guest feature, Freddie Fox. His verse is just line for line for line. There's punchlines, if not every bar, every other bar. Um, and I mean, just as you're digesting one, you get the next one, right? So you get something as cutesy as, Gloria gain on you, I will survive. When they talk about the nicest MC, I don't come up. But when they talk about the livest MC, I say, what up? Clever, clever, not not head scratchers, but letting you know you're dealing with a certain level of wit. So by the time you get to a setup like the entendre where you saw about the game metaphor, and he's saying, in this game, y'all kind of like the ref. Uh-huh, you disrespect, click, clack, you get the tech. So in, in that game metaphor, he's saying, in this biz, I'm sort of like the ref, which is him speaking to the fact that, look, yeah, I know I'm from a, a this era, you might have remembered me, Freddie Fox coming out earlier, and, and he makes a callback to that where he talks about, I came in the game in 89 spitting buck 50s, using the term buck 50 in his 1989 single when he first came out. So he's saying, yes, yes, I'm not a player. I'm not trying to run with the youngins. I just want you to know that I'm better than you youngins where I can keep up with you youngins, but I'll be fine just being in the game. I'm the rep, I'm calling the shot. So he says, <laughs> I'm like the ref, uh-huh. You disrespect, click, clack, you get the tech. Double entendre there, the tech being a, a reference to a technical foul in a game where he is acting as the ref, but also letting you know you disrespect, click, clack. Man, it's just genius. And that's the level of cleverness you're getting all throughout Freddie Fox's verse. And so he is the presence of punchlines on this album. Uh, safe to say, you probably don't need anyone else. g has some clever setups and, and they come close to that. Lil Fame does a little bit, but it really is Freddie Fox Bumpy Knuckles here who, who brings the punchlines. What Guru specializes in is poetic wisdom. And because of the 5% influence here, uh, it's, it's showing all throughout. I know Inspector Deck gets a lot of props for his presence on Above the Clouds. But in hindsight, I really do think it was a surprise element that hyped that appearance up. Because when you think about what in Inspector Deck is actually saying on the track, and especially if you read the lyrics, this sounds interchangeable with most Inspector Deck Wu-Tang lyrics at the time. This could easily have been a verse on the Wu-Tang Forever album the year before. There's nothing special being said, except for when we die hard, they build a monument to honor us with humongous effect on the world we could have conquered it that's about it and, and you know what, what guru is doing he's using really pretty poetic language to really illustrate this idea of using mind power as a weapon to help others so fighting a war with mind power and what i'll do is i'll put both of their verses side by side so you can see some of the the weightiness of what Guru's saying compared to what Deck is saying, and I know it's it's not a comparison. It doesn't have to be. I only bring this up because everyone talked about the Deck verse and the beat, and I think what Guru did on this track uh, gets overlooked. It's probably one of his more defining moments as a, a rap writer. He does some of that on the first verse of Royalty. He's going into that same space, like, hey, I'm telling you the power you have inside. Here's my way of saying it. 
When he's dropping jewels or speaking in a focused direction on a topic, it's memorable. Okay, so these are all things to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats, and that takes us to dimension seven, the concepts. I don't know, there's there's conceptual setups, the the prompts, and this is also the first album that I can recall that addresses the idea that Guru's been running around calling himself a New Yorker forever, as long as he's been on the scene with Gangstar, even though it's known that he's from Boston and he's never really explicitly denied it or gone in detail about that. And, and so they do this in the form of a, a talking skit right before the song New York Straight Talk, where, where they got the guy saying, yo, what's up with your man, Kuru? You think he's from New York? And Primo does the explaining. The song doesn't really explain it, but you know, there's these moments. So conceptually, yeah, the setups for the songs probably give them more of a conceptual tone than the actual songs do. JFK to LAX, that phone conversation right before the song comes on. Moment of truth, all the phone calls from the women telling Guru to keep his head up before the song really comes on. I think that was a subtle nod to also saying, hey, look, how could I be this violent man towards women? Look at all this support from these different women that I get. Um, that was a subtle way of addressing that without putting it in the verses. Uh, same thing with New York Straight Talk, how I mentioned it, it says the thing before going into the song and in, in memory of the setup is, is setting the stage for Guru to like pick a name to focus on. So he, he focuses on two names and, and does verses about them. The shackles on the end of the setup and so the most directly conceptual song on it is gonna be The Mall. It's straightforward, but at least it's in a, it's, it's in a shell of an idea of, hey, this is what it's like when we go shopping, or let's see how creative I can be about a song dealing with shopping at the mall. Robin Hood Theory in title is conceptual, but not in the actual song. It's more topical. So it appears that The Mall is as directly conceptual as you get and everything else is more conceptual in the setup but not in the execution you guys tell me if you see anything else that you feel like is actually a concept on here and something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats that takes us to the content dimensions dimension eight the external content how much outside of his inner monologue and <laughs> soliloquy of chaos is Google speaking about and dimension nine the internalized content how much expository and autobiographical material is Google giving you all right so we've talked about all these songs already um and i mentioned how they're more topical than than anything else a really really interesting thing that Google does is that he'll give you subtopics within the topic. So there's a few songs on here where he switches the angle up. So you take a track like The Rep Grows Bigger. In the first two verses, Guru is telling this tale of this fictional character, probably a continuation from one of the original hits, Just To Get A Rep. And just kind of the ills and pitfalls of the choices that he's making. But the third verse turns around and flips to being about Gangstar's journey since stepping into the industry, the growth and challenges they faced as a duo. He does the same thing on Moment of Truth, where the first two verses are a mix of his own struggles and talking about universal struggles. I, I noted already that Primo said pieces of the second verse are about the duo himself and their, their little internal beef. But the third verse, he switches the lens on phony rappers. He's like, hey, it's your, it's your moment of truth. <laughs> and then on royalty, similarly, the first verse is about him and people recognizing their own power. And then the second verse is about women, women recognizing their own power and then how women are towards him and how he is towards women. So he switches the angles often, but keeps it on the same topic. And that's a way of blending both the external and internal content. So more than anything else, you're getting that blending of both. 
he tries to do that on JFK to LAX, where the first verse is about these little nods to his case. But then the second verse, he's talking about the state of black people. He's like, oh, you know, they're trying to trap us. You need to read, study lessons. And I talked to this rich Nigerian and asked about why African-Americans fall into the traps that they fall into. The pivots, the pivots there. I mentioned how in my advice to you, he's talking to this friend about the downward patterns that he noticed the friend going through, but also speaking about his recognition of his own faults and, and falling down. That's, that shapes the album more than anything else. In memory of, he's talking about these lost homies and loved ones, but he's still speaking from an I standpoint of, here are my memories of you, here's how I remember you, here's how I'm going to carry on your spirit. Robin Hood Theory is probably the, the biggest one about any external issue, uh, where he's going off of this principle of, you know, the hero, the legend of Robin Hood, rob from the rich and give to the poor. And he's saying he's going to lead the charge in doing that. He's talking about the greedy companies, the people in power, the powers that be, and talking about equal distribution of resources, and especially for the youth. This song is for the children more than anything else. This is like, let's let's make something, let's start a new foundation for the seeds to grow. There's no punches pulled on Guru's mission to, to spread knowledge. He manages to do this without sounding preachy though, but that's probably the most external because even in She Knows What She Wants, he's putting himself in the second verse. He sets you up by describing this choosy woman who gets what she wants by any means, but then he brings himself into it on how she got over on him and how he had to pull himself from that situation. Even the lighter content is still content. The mall is still content. Betrayal is content. BI versus friendship is still content. And, and that means sometimes not all content is good content. We take a song like New York Straight Talk and the question becomes, was this a necessary song? Did you need this track on here? Because we've heard you do songs like The Planet, where you were writing your love letter to Brooklyn on the previous album. This song actually seems like a missed opportunity for Guru to really explain what motivated him to move from Boston and claim New York in the first place. He just wraps it from the position of, yeah, I'm a New Yorker and this is how we get down. He uses we language, we, we, we. There's nothing really stand out about what Guru does on that song. The beat is the most standout part of that. So it seemed like filler material and some people could argue that the mall, as creative as it tried to be, seemed like filler material. All these things are something to consider when you're thinking about Dimension 8, the externalized content, and Dimension 9, the internalized content, on a scale from one to five heartbeats. Takes us to the final dimension, Dimension 10, the storytelling. There are storytelling aspects all throughout this album. Uh, JFK to LAX tries to tell a story, but again, that's more in the setup than the actual verses. The rep grows bigger, gives the impression that it's given a story, but it's not a straightforward tale of this character. It's just pieces and bits of cause and effect in those first two verses before it talks about Gangstar's journey. And it, even that's not a story. It's just giving you the highlights. And, and she knows what she wants. It, it's describing the woman it's describing his feelings from their interaction, but it doesn't really say, this is how I met her, this is how she got me, this is the consequence. He's just saying, yeah, I interacted with her, I got played, but I know what I want too. And it just cuts off. Um, so yeah, Betrayal becomes the only straight up story on this album. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, uh, I, I talked about how Guru sounded like he phoned it in, but Again, upon revisiting, I realized how much Scarface sounds like he just phoned in this verse. These are two seasoned rappers, Scarface being a rapper who's mostly heralded and applauded for his storytelling capability. Primo describes the song almost not making the cut and saying that Scarface took so long to turn his verse in that they were about to take the song off the album because it was right up to the point where they had to turn it into the label. And he came through at the last minute. But uh, is it safe to say it shows? It seems like neither Guru or Scarface are 
really driving home the point of betrayal or embodying betrayal in any compelling way that makes you go, oh, that's messed up. So Guru's verse, he's talking about a street dude that goes and robs this young kid's dad and kills the whole family in front of the kid. And the giveaway is that the kid remembers him because he's wearing the same slacks that he wore when he took him to the racetrack. And those are only words that you hear in the very last line of the song. He knew it was him because he wore the same slacks when he took him to the racetrack. Why would he do that? It's called betrayal. <laughs> the driest, flattest delivery of a reveal that you might have heard in rap history. And it, it seemed a little forced. It seemed like, oh, I got to make this last story rap. It seemed a little pushed out there, just like story for the sake of a story. Same thing with Scarface. His rhyme is about two brothers. One is a young athlete on his way to having hoop dreams. The other's heavy in the game. And he's telling his brother not to get into the game. And one of them gets shot. It's not clear which one gets shot. And it's not by either of the two. They get shot by a group of thugs that yeah, <laughs> and, and, and and that's it. And I'm like, I don't really hear the betrayal in that. If we're talking about a depiction of brotherly love betrayal, it might be best to just get to the point. Uh, and a great example of that is what Dice Raw did on the song Episodes from the Roots Illadelph Half-Life album, which we reviewed. And in his verse, I'll never forget the stark imagery of him saying this tale of these two brothers and one being so warped by the game that he killed his brother. And it works because he he sets it up in a way that makes you invested in the outcome. You know, right before he gets to the betrayal line, he says, and you got this one to say, I'ma die hustling. F everybody except my brother who I'm trusting in. And so the next line where he's like, I guess he just did not know the truth because the following week I seen threw him off the roof. And sometimes I wonder what the, I think about that. Like you see the visual right away. It's like watching a movie. Yes, you see this brother who's like, yo, I don't care about my brother. And in the next scene, he's tossing his brother off the roof or his brother's tossing him off the roof. I've got the betrayal from that more than I got from either of the verses on this song, Betrayal. And you guys can correct me if y'all heard something that I didn't hear or if y'all read something that I didn't read. But the fact that I have to think this hard about a song called Betrayal from two veteran MCs means that they probably missed the mark and it didn't land how it was supposed to land. Uh, the best thing about this song is the O effect of seeing the collaboration and the beat. So these are all things to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. If you consider those things to be weaknesses, or not very impactful, all right? And with that, that concludes our category two breakdown and review of the 1998 classic turning 25 years old today, Moment of Truth by Gangstar. And I'll say once again, rest in peace to Guru. And with that, I'd also like to say happy 10th anniversary to Plates and Crates. It's been a journey, y'all, but y'all know what it is. Help me celebrate, and until next time, F a rap critic. They talk about it while I live it. Word to meth.